So I'm actually going to talk about the risks posed. Uh, <laughs> And this is more of a policy, well, this is absolutely a policy talk rather than a technical talk. Um, and I'm willing to bet that almost all of you are better at the technical breaking in than I am here. I might be better at the mathematics, but I suspect in a, in a conference of sysadmins, I am well beat on the, on the breaking in part. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is exemplified by these three. If you haven't seen the film, the Lives of Others, and that's what the wiretapper over on the left is. Lives of Others is a, is a film about surveillance in East Germany just before the fall of the wall. And it gives a better sense than anything I know of the corruption of society that occurs when you have excessive surveillance. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is mostly policy that's being pressed by the FBI, although in some cases it's also been by the US government. And then finally, I have a BlackBerry in there because I want to emphasize how international the issue is. Um, so when we talk about wiretapping, the issue is which technology. That's the phone that I and a couple of people in the audience grew up with. And what's striking about that phone is that it doesn't move. It's, I, I have one actually on my desk, an old one, not a, a facsimile, an old one. So when you pick it up, it, it weighs a number of pounds. It worked very well, by the way, in the snowstorm. Uh, it, that we had in New England uh, in October. My town did uh, emergency phone calls at 1 a.m. in the morning to tell us that there was a snow emergency and not to go out on the road. And it turns out that our phones upstairs are electric, which we knew, but that meant when the phone rang and we answered them, there was no phone because uh, the power had already gone out. And so we had to run down and answer this one. But this one, um, those phones um, don't move. Um, but they're actually uh, not particularly hard. Well, they don't move. Um, and it, uh, the phone company, when it was designing the phone networks, one of the, va the, the most important value to AT&T was that uh, the quality of the voice, OK? And every time you go through a switch, the quality of the voice diminishes. So AT&T decided you're going to have a maximum of five switches, which means you have a centralized architecture for phones. So wiretapping uh, phones like that were really easy. You put the wiretap on at the phone central office. I'm going to assume a certain amount of technical stuff about phones that if you guys don't know, I can probably see you, even though I have a bright light in my face, I can probably see you, and you can stop me as I'm speaking. Um, then, of course, there are these types of phones. Um, these types of phones are now mostly digital. But even so, um, the way they work is typically centralized, well, in fact, all of them are, are centralized telephone communications. Um, they still, and so wiretapping them is not particularly hard. And I, I say the particularly because there are three cases you have to consider. If the phone is in its normal home district, the wiretap just goes on the home location register. And so when a call goes through, the call gets tapped. If the, call, if the caller is roaming, when a call comes into the phone, it comes into what's called the home location register, and then it, that location register knows where the, call, where, the, where the owner of the phone is, the user of the phone is, and then uh, the call gets directed to the, the right cell tower, the visiting location register. But the point, point is that the tap gets activated at the home location register. So two of the cases are very easy to tap. The third case the case the visitor is roaming and, and she makes a call out from the phone. The first time she makes a call out from the phone, it goes to the home location register in order for the visitor, visiting location register, to check that there's actually money on the phone and that they will be paid for the call. After that box is checked, in that location, nothing, no other calls actually go through the home location register. So what that means is that tapping an outgoing call is actually somewhat more complicated. You can still do it, but the characteristics of the call typically are different than if there isn't a tap on the line. So it may alert an astute caller that they're actually being tapped. But the fact is, tapping cell phones and tapping uh, wireline phones are not particularly hard because they're centralized. Facebook is also centralized, as is Gmail, and as is many, well, in fact, all cloud computing. The communication goes into the cloud, something is done there, and then the communication goes out. So if you want to wiretap a Facebook communication or a Gmail, you have to go to Facebook, you have to go to Google and tell them with a court order that you're going to tap, but the communication is in a central place. 
Decentralized communications are easy to tap, but what's not easy to tap, of course, is peer-to-peer. -peer. Doesn't mean you can't do it, it just means it's much more complicated. So let me tell you, in fact, the what's, this is my sole technical slide, by the way. Let me tell you what's, what's complicated to tap. You have Alice, who's sitting at the airport lounge, and you have Bob sitting at the coffee house. Bob, uh, Alice's local ISP at the airport lounge is Fly ISP. Her um, VoIP provider is IP Voice. Bob, so her VoIP gnome name is Alice at IP Voice. Bob's local provider is SIPS ISP, and his VoIP provider is Packet Talk. So he is Bob at Packet Talk. Bob wants to talk to Alice, so Bob puts down at, at packet puts down on his machine. He wants to talk at Alice at, uh, to talk to Alice at um, IP Voice. What happens is SIPS ISP says, "Oh, Bob is Bob at Packet Talk." The communication goes from SIPS ISP to Packet Talk, and then across to IP Voice. IP Voice says, "Let me check if Alice is online." Oops, Alice is online at Fly ISP. Her IP address is blah. And then Packet Talk and IP Voice do a rendezvous and exchange IP addresses. That's the last time Packet Talk and IP Voice are involved in the communication. The rest of the communication goes through the internet cloud one way or another. What that does is complicate wiretapping because who, suppose Bob is the subject of a wiretap order, that wiretap order is at Packet Talk. So Packet Talk knows where Bob is right now, but Packet Talk can't tell SIPS ISP to do a wiretap. Lots of reasons why it can't. First of all, it's not Packet Talk's responsibility. It's the responsibility of law enforcement with a court order. But second of all, who knows who SIPS ISP is? Is, is it some fly-by-night ISP? Is it a fly I ISP owned by organized crime? or nation state or bad guys that you don't want to inform that you're, you're tapping Bob. So it's absolutely not the case that Packet Talk can inform SIPS ISP. Packet Talk can inform law enforcement, hey, this person of interest that you want to tap um, is at this IP address. But by the time all that communication happens, the call may be done. So it's the mobility and the fact that users don't have fixed addresses. They have fixed phone numbers in the cell network, but they don't have fixed IP addresses. It's what makes wiretapping so complicated. Having told you that, I want to back, I want to move in a different direction for a bit, and I want to talk about policy. I want to talk about where wiretapping law comes from. Um, in the United States, in the 1750s, um, the British were using what are called writs of assistance. Writs of assistance are generalized writs. They say, you can search this guy's house. It doesn't have to particularize what you're searching for. It was at that point, actually in this city, um, where Otis, James Otis, was asked to defend the British writs of assistance, and instead he came up with the principle that you need to particularize what you're searching for. Gave a very famous speech, and over the, the tw intervening 25 years, uh, and the War of Independence and so on, this speech essentially led to the Fourth Amendment, which says you need to particularize, you need to particularly describe the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. What that means is when law enforcement has a search warrant to search for marijuana plants, they can't open a night table draw and uncover a, an unregistered weapon because you can't grow marijuana plants in a night table draw. On the other hand, if you have a search warrant to look for an unregistered weapon and you come upon the, the inside growing place for, for marijuana, that's okay. It's okay to discover something illegal that isn't the subject of a search warrant as long as you find it in the course, in the natural course of searching for the item. <coughs> One thing I want to emphasize here is that the Fourth Amendment is about security. We tend to think of it as a privacy amendment, but it's a, an amendment that says the right of the people to be secure. So, U.S. history of wiretapping in five minutes or less. It's actually a full semester course in, in a law school. Um, in the 1920s, wiretapping came up, started as soon as we had the telegraph, and Jeb Stewart uh, used to travel with a wiretapper to listen in on, on what the... Um, the other side was doing during the Civil War. Um, it was used by law enforcement some, 
but it became particularly used during prohibition. And the reason that it became used during prohibition is you had conspiracies, which were hard to penetrate by other means. These were conspiracies where often law enforcement was involved, being paid off. And, um, and the telephone was often a useful device with which to communicate. So in 1928, uh, the feds were wiretapping Roy Olmsted. He was running a $2 million a year operation in Seattle. He had one farm. I can't recall if it's two or three ships, but $2 million a year operation 80 years ago, 90 years, uh, 80 years ago, is an amazing size operation. The feds put a wiretap on in the basement of the office building and outside the houses of him and his co-conspirators. No warrant. Case went all the way to the Supreme Court where Olmsted's lawyers argued that it was um, a violation of, of the Fourth Amendment and therefore of the Fifth Amendment, the right against self-incrimination. Um, Supreme Court didn't buy it. Supreme Court said there was no intrusion and therefore uh, no violation of the Fifth. The most important opinion in that case was that of, of Louis Brandeis, who said, when you intrude upon a person's conversations, you're intruding not only by one person, but on, with who, on everyone with whom he communicates. And this is a huge intrusion. Court, the Supreme Court didn't see it that way for 40 years. Um, till 1967 and the Katz case. But in 1934, the Congress passed um, the Federal Communications Act, which said no interception or divulgence of wired communications. And in 1937, there was another bootlegging case, Nardone. That case also went to the Supreme Court. Nardone's lawyers were smarter than Brandeis's lawyers because they argued it on the basis of the Federal Communications Act, Supreme Court said no interception or divulgence. Two years later, the Nardone's, Nardone was back. He want, his lawyers wanted to know that if Nardone got wiretapped, they couldn't use wiretap evidence in the court because it had been illegally obtained. Could they use evidence derived from the wiretap? And the Supreme Court said no, no fruit of the poisoned tree. That's 1939, pretty clear, no interception or divulgence. Except that the Second World War broke out J. Edgar Hoover went to Roosevelt and said, there, there are suspicious aliens in the United States. I need to be able to wiretap. And there was a loophole in no interception and divulgence. The loophole was the and. What if you intercept but don't divulge? And so for the next 25 years, 28 years, FBI wiretapped. And as long as it didn't divulge, which it took to mean it could use wiretap evidence in court as long as it didn't say it was a wiretap. <laughs> I am not joking here. Um, there are, the wiretap evidence was hidden in files in Hoover's office. It was called confidential source. And in the cases where it did get revealed that it was a wiretap, the case got thrown out of court. Um, Hoover not only wiretapped criminal suspects, he also wiretapped members of the Supreme Court, staff members in Congress. At one point, he bugged uh, Kennedy, John Kennedy, during the Second World War when Joe Kennedy thought that John Kennedy might be sleeping with a spy. Turned out the woman he was sleeping with was not a spy. Um, the interesting thing about that story is the bugged conversations were still in Hoover's files in 1960 when Kennedy became president. Okay, So now you understand. Um, I've now explained to you why no one went after Hoover for a long time, no one in Congress. When Russell Long did that, um, Senator Russell Long of Mississippi, did, Senator Representative, did that in 1965. Um, there was a story a few week day, weeks later in Life magazine describing him accepting money from the Longshoremen's Union, which was uh, assumed to be bribes, and he lost his seat. Anyway, let me move forward to 1967. There's a case where a, uh, somebody is gambling in uh, Los Angeles using a public phone to place his bets. Um, the feds have a bug on the outside of the public phone. It picks up his conversation. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, having whittled away the ability to bug without a warrant, in 1967, the Supreme Court says, even in so public a place as a private phone booth, um, you have a right to privacy. The Fourth Amendment protects people, not places. 
and urged Congress that if they wanted to allow wiretapping in criminal cases, they had to put on, they had to have a, a law to do so. So you get Title III in 1968, and then you get the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978. The 1968 law says you can only wiretap with probable cause that the person is committing a serious crime. There's a list of the serious crimes. At the time the law was passed, it was about 25. Now it's close to 100. Not all of them are the ones that we would consider serious. That is, sale of marijuana is in there. On the other hand, many of them are what we'd call serious crimes, kidnapping, or various aspects of organized crime, and so on. It took 10 years to pass the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act uh, because Watergate intervened. The difference between the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act at a gross level from, from Title III um, is that the um, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is instead of probable cause that it's a serious crime that's being committed, it's probable cause that the person is the, an agent of a foreign power. It's been amended to include an agent of a foreign power or a terrorist group. It's been further amended to a member of a terrorist group can, that can consist of size one. So that opens up the possibility of abuse. It's called the lone, wealth, lone wolf clause. In fact, as far as I know, the lone wolf clause, clause has never actually been, been used since it passed, I believe, in the Patriot Act in 2001. But what I want to focus on is actually the second half of, of the talk the second half of that timeline, or the last third of that timeline. Um, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act is a 1994 act that does something very unusual. 1968 and 1978 laws say you can wiretap if you have the following things, and you can do, this is the procedure for doing so. 1994 law says phone companies have to build their switches digitally, any, any, any phone network with digital switches has to build their switches to accommodate wiretaps. Now, this is weird from a whole bunch of reasons, a whole bunch of vantage points. Where did the law come from? 19, um, I'm going to forget Judge Green's decision. I want to say 1982, 1984. In any case, the phone company gets split up. What happens for law enforcement when the phone company gets split up is instead of dealing with one company, and one source of suppliers of phone equipment, it's dealing with lots of them. It's also dealing with a changing rate of innovation. When the phone company didn't have competitors, it could innovate at the rate it wanted to. Now, in fact, what you get is a change from innovation on switches by phone companies to innovation on switches by the companies that you guys are used to dealing with, Cisco and so on. So what happens is that all of a sudden law enforcement finds itself unable to wiretap. Let me give you an example, call forwarding. The way phone company wiretapped at the time pre calia is they put a tap on at what's called the frame, where the phone, call, phone lines come in from the separate houses and they're numbered and put in sequentially, put the tap there. But call forwarding, the call never goes down that line. The call comes into the frame and it goes out again before it goes down the line because that's what the call forwarding does. So you do the old type of, of wiretapping, it doesn't work. Kalia says you have to build your switches to accommodate um, um, wiretapping. You get a whole bunch of new things. Um, I guess I could have done these slides, but, but I'm going to skip. I didn't remember they were here. Pro Title III, I've already told you about foreign intelligence. So you, um, that's what I wanted to show you. Um, you have a whole bunch of things. So let me back up and just show you this one. So Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act says we're going from my black telephone of the 1950s and 60s to digital switches. We then go in 2001 to 2008 through a whole series of, of wiretap laws. Patriot Act, it did a whole bunch of changes. The most important change from my vantage point was that it changed the requirement for a FISA tap. So in a FISA tap, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA tap says in order to uh, get a FISA tap, foreign intelligence has to be the primary purpose of the tap. In 2001, Patriot Act changes it to significant purpose of the tap. What does that mean? I mean, you know, you guys are all sysadmins, not, not lawyers, right, or policy types. It's actually a really important change. And the reason it's important is when you say significant purpose rather than primary purpose, it means you can do a FISA tap for a foreign intelligence reason 
and then take the evidence, you have to show that there's reason to do so, and transfer it over to a criminal investigation. Why is that important? Congress cared a lot in 1968 that law enforcement not be able to tap without good reason, because they knew the power that such surveillance provides. When you, in order to wiretap somebody for foreign intelligence, there's a lower burden of proof, and the reason for the lower burden of proof is in a criminal wiretap, what the government can do is throw the person in jail. Most foreign intelligence wiretaps do not result in the person going to jail because the government doesn't want to reveal what it's learned. If, they, if it does do so, it, it reveals only a little bit. When you get the tap under a FISA tap, it's a lower, under a FISA court order, it's a lower burden of proof. If you can then transfer the information over to a criminal investigation, it lowers the, the burden of proof on the government. So that's the most important aspect of the Patriot Act and probably the most controversial from a wiretapping point of view. Other pieces of Patriot were not so controversial. For example, in order to do, does everybody know what pen register and trap and trace are? Yes? No, so there's at least one no. Um, trap and trace, uh, uh, pen register collects all the numbers dialed into a, uh, out of a phone, trap and trace collects all the numbers dialed into the phone. Um, it used to be prior to the Patriot Act, if you wanted a pen register or trap and trace order, you had to get it in each one of the jurisdictions through which the communication was traveling. That's nonsense. Patriot Act simplified that. There's some other pieces that simplified. What you got also in 2001, except we didn't know it at the time, was the warrantless wiretapping. In 2003, FBI went to Congress, uh, uh, went to the Federal announced that it needed to extend CALEA. So if you go and you read the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, the law explicitly says that it, uh, it applies to digitally switched telephone networks and not to information services. 1994 information services are the internet. There was a statement about substantial replacement service and it could apply to a substantial replacement service, but you guys are all techies which means you're mathematical. Um, so you can either be a lawyer or you can be a mathematician. Either way, you can read the law. It says the same thing of A or B but not C, and you know how to parse it. So FBI wanted to extend CALEA to cases of voice over IP. They uh, went to the Federal Communications Commission first. Uh, FCC said okay. Civil liberties organizations and computer companies took the FCC to court. We expected to win because we figured people could read A or B but not C. Two of the, the judges went with the FCC and the FBI. The third one did not. He said, read the law. Okay, but a two to one decision meant that CALEA applies to VoIP. Now, the FCC only applied it to very simple cases of VoIP, what's called facilities-based broadband, which is essentially, it looks like the phone company from my phone to the phone central office can be VoIP from there, but if it looks like the phone company from my phone to the phone central office, it's no different technically than, than wiretapping a, phone, a, a regular phone, okay? So it's a big change in terms of the law and regulation. It's not a big change technically. Then we get the warrantless wiretapping becomes public in, 19, in 2006, 2000, December 2005. Big brouhaha. It gets suspended at one point. And then um, the Protect America Act and got, happened, and I'll talk about that in a moment. It got extended briefly, but, but let me actually tell you these pieces. So FBI, as I've told you, pushed for the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act to extend from digital switches to the Internet. In, at least in terms of VoIP. Protect America Act. So you guys, most of you are American, you're used to seeing maps that look like this, which is to say the U.S. is in the center. But in this particular case, the U.S. is in the center for, for a really good reason. In the fiber optic build out that happened in the 1990s, um, the fiber optic cables went to the U.S. So if you're in South America, if you're in Argentina and you want to make a call to Brazil, used to be, pre the fiber optic build out, you made the call through satellite phone. Satellite, satellite, uh, not satellite phone, but through satellite. Satellite means there's a quarter second delay. People don't like quarter second delays in conversation. We're just programmed that that bothers us. Once you put in a fiber optic cable from Argentina and Brazil to Miami, the call goes through Miami, okay? 
So now you have a foreign call transiting Miami. Or you have somebody using Gmail or Yahoo or MSN. That's transiting a server in the United States. Or you have a communication between Taiwan and China. And there was a long period where you weren't allowed to dial directly from Taiwan to China. But you could do it if you dialed through a switch in the United States. Well, if you're AT&T and you're smart, when you write the contract with Taiwan and you write the contract with China, you don't make it for six months. You make it for many years, which means that even after Taiwan can directly call China, often it still goes through the switch in, in California. So for all those reasons, <coughs> The NSA felt that there were communications transiting the U.S. that were not really U.S.-based communications. And there had been an exemption in FISA. FISA had said, you need a wiretap whenever it's a U.S. person, and a U.S. person includes someone in the United States. But, but if it was a radio communication with at least one person outside the United States, you didn't need a wiretap order. So NSA said, look, it looks like uh, a communication with one end outside the United States, except because the technology changed, blah, 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 we shouldn't have to get a wiretap order. That was the technical argument. Uh, I don't know, and nobody knows because it's classified, exactly the set of arguments that the Bush administration made. But um, that, when it became public that the government was wiretapping uh, within the United States without a court order, there was a lot of concern about it and a lot of pushback. Let me tell you a little bit more. I told you about the phone call from Brazil to Argentina going through a switch in Miami. And I said switch, and I meant switch. Because if you're going to wiretap with one end outside the United States, and your justification is you used to be able to and it's just coming through fiber optic cable rather than radio, then you would want the tap to be as close to the edge of the United States as possible as in it's what's called the cable head, where it comes in, rather than at the switch. Now, I assume all of you know about the uh, wiretapping in the San Francisco office of AT&T. Yes, that's familiar? Anybody to whom it's not familiar? OK. So um, around the time that the warrantless wiretapping became public, a man named Mark Klein, who'd been a technician in the AT&T switching office, a peering office in um, San Francisco, produced a set of papers uh, that, he's, uh, that, that came from that office in which the signal in that office was split. The fiber optic cable was swit, split. Some of it went and did its normal peering and so on, but some of it went into a secret room. And it was clear that what was happening in that secret room is that there was filtering and then a certain amount of communication was being shipped across the country. And that this was being duplicated in a number of offices across the US. Um, what I can tell you about that is if you only want to pull communications where one end is outside the United States, you don't do it at the switching office. You do it at the cable head. This was happening at the switching office. The next thing that came out a few months later is that the NSA was getting call detail records um, just by the bushel, uh, more than by the bushel. Um, it was getting them without court order. That was uncovered by USA Today. So after the pushback from Congress, this was suspended for a time, at which point the Protect America Act was passed in the summer of 2007. It said you could wiretap without a court order if one end of the communication was believed to be outside the United States. Very controversial law. Um, it was good for six months, which in itself tells you something weird that is going on. Because if a wiretapping law is only good for six months, <laughs> you know, how, how do you do it? It was extended for two weeks in January and then not extended again. In the summer of 2008, it was FISA Amendments Act. There will be a quiz afterwards. <laughs> um, let me see if I can't possibly remember all the different aspects. I, I do remember that when the FISA Amendments Act passed, uh, Whit Diffie and I had a paper coming out in uh, Scientific American about wiretapping. And the act passed as I was dealing with the page proofs. And I had to do a picture very much like this. And I kept getting pieces of it wrong. And all the lawyers who had litigated this in the court couldn't fix it. I finally found one lawyer who found the one place that there was a, something wrong. And I kept being on the phone over the weekend. I was in Paris. And I kept being on the phone in an email to the, the uh, Scientific American editor saying, we've got to get the picture right. But there is 
The, compl the complexities of this include Are you inside the United States or outside the United States? We know, you know, we know legally you're inside the United States, but in many ways, the U.S., Canada, and Mexican phone lines are all one, one system. That is at least how AT&T did it back in the old days, which means that there is not an unreasonable chance that the call will actually go through Canada, um, <coughs> especially if it's a cell call. Um, there is... When it's an IP communication, you don't always know where the IP address is. Somebody buys a block of IP addresses, you think that company is in Arkansas, but they sell a sub-block to somebody else, and those IP addresses aren't in Arkansas. Or maybe you think they're in Quebec, but it turns out some of them are not in Quebec, they're in Arkansas. So very complex thing. The one place that changed on privacy is under FISA, you didn't need a court order to tap an American overseas, and under FISA Amendments Act, you do. Okay? Um, but let me move on. So I want to talk to you about how efficacious proposed solutions are, and the answer is it depends on the case. So when uh, I moved into this from, from concern about crypto and crypto regulations and crypto export regulations, that was a battle during the 1990s, and one of the arguments for CALEA was kidnapping cases. The FBI Director Louis Free would go to con Congress people and say, kidnapping, you wouldn't want a kid kidnapped in your district and we wouldn't be able to, to get the call. Um, and of course, everybody has kids in their district. So one of the things I did is there's a wiretap report. Every year, the US government releases something called the wiretap report. It lists every Title III wiretap in the country who the DA was, who the judge was, how long the tap was for, what the most serious crime was, whether there were arrests, whether there were convictions, how many incriminating conversations, how many non-incriminating. Looking at the numbers, this is up to um, the cell phone era, and I'll explain why the cell phone era changes it. Up to the cell phone era, there were about six cases a year in which wiretaps were used, out of 450 kidnappings a year. Why that difference? If you First of all, you don't know who the kidnapper is, so you can't put a wiretap order on them. Second of all, if you're listening in at the family, that's called a consensual overhear. Okay? It's not a wiretap from the point of view of law, and it's not a wiretap from the point of view of technology. Why do things change with the cell phone era? Because a lot of kidnappings are not what we normally think of as kidnappings. They're the taking of the child, a, a child by the non-custodial parent. Okay? then you actually do track their, the, the non-custodial parent's phone or the kid's phone. And, and so you are doing a type of wiretapping, um, but it's not the kind that we think of. So these numbers only apply to pre-cell phone era. Other kinds of investigations, wiretap laws originally passed because of gambling. Um, wiretap laws passed because of organized crime and it was a way to track organized crime. Organized crime was dependent on gambling. That changed in the 1970s for all sorts of reasons, including state lotteries. Um, organized crime is now into drugs as are wiretaps. June 2006 Department of Justice counterterrorism paper says there are 441 defendants charged with terrorism, but when you actually look at the numbers, they look less impressive. Only 123 got prison sentences. 14 for five years or more, six for 20 years or more. Having said that, I'll now undermine myself by saying, on the other hand, of those 441 people, some of those people were here illegally. Getting them out of the country was all the law enforcement cared about doing. Charging them in this way got them out of the country. Um, and some of these guys were quite bad guys of these 14 and six. But now let me flip it again and tell you about a particular bad guy. So I don't know how many of you are familiar or paid attention to the case of Najibullah Zazi. Uh, he was Pakistani living in, uh, sorry, Afghani, uh, grew up partially in Pakistan and then in the United States. Um, he moved with his family to Denver at some point. He'd been, he got married to a Pakistani cousin and he did a number of tri trips to Pakistan to be with his wife. Uh, um, at some point, um, well, some point, September 2009, uh, there appears this story in the New York Times, not, not this particular one. 
Um, it says uh, somebody is arrested, Nanji Bulazazi has been arrested on suspicion of terrorism. His car was searched as he uh, stopped uh, as he was coming into New York on the George Washington Bridge. Nothing was found. He got tipped off by somebody that he was being followed, and he began leaving. Uh, he left New York and began driving west, and he got arrested. He denies any terrorism activity. A series of stories went on for a few days. Then he uh, then things got a little bit more complex. His father and his uncle got arrested, and then you see guilty plea made in bomb plot. Okay, what happened? The U.S. government was listening in to him on phone calls. They were obviously not listening very carefully because in August of 2009, he had uh, rented a hotel room twice in Denver. They only searched him, the hotel room, after the second time. And the second time in the, in the uh, deposition to the court, not deposition, in the... Uh, in the document that the law enforcement submitted to the court, it says, after three increasingly frantic phone calls on the second occasion that he was in the, the hotel room, blah, 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 Zazi did blah, 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 blah. The FBI went in after the second time he'd rented the hotel room, found trace chemicals on the stove, on, on, the, on the fan above the stove. Zazi was boiling down hydrogen peroxide and, and other chemicals to make a, a bomb. They're, they're chemicals that you can buy for hairdressing. Um, why do I say they weren't listening very carefully? Because the FBI did not go in the first time he went to the hotel room. It was the second time he was there, the three increasingly um, desperate phone calls that tipped them off. In fact, this was a guy who did want to bomb subway cars. He was planning to bomb them on the ninth anniversary of September 11th. This was a case where wiretapping was actually re extremely important. Having told you that, I want to tell you what other tools law enforcement has. And the tool it has that's become remarkably valuable is transactional information. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was the guy who planned September 11th. He was picked up in Pakistan on the uh, by tracking his cell phone. There were two sets of bombings in September 2000, in uh, July 2005 in London. The first destroyed three subway cars and, and one bus and killed, I don't remember how many people, and injured many, many more. The second fizzled, but it didn't mean the people who were, tried to do it weren't serious. One of them got tracked to Rome through his cell phone. The Marshal Service, the U.S. Marshal Service tracks fugitives used to take an average of 42 days. Now it takes two. Why does it take two? Because you check where the guy is the evening at 10 o'clock at night. You check where he is at 8 a.m. in the morning. And you check who of his family friends lives in that district. And then you pick him up the next day. Let me give you another example, which strikes very close to home, um, although I guess most of you are not from Boston. Uh, the guy who was finding masseuses on uh, Craigslist and then attempting to rob them and in one case murdered them. Police picked up a photo of somebody checking his cell phone as he left the hotel shortly after the first of these things happened. Uh, they matched cell phones, got a court order to, uh, and, and they, they looked at the records for cell phones at, at the two cases, got a court order to search his house and found evidence. That's how they found him. Transactional information is remarkably revelatory. Let me point out this is not your parents' communications world. When I was growing up, in order to call London, which my family did because my grandparents lived there, you had to book the call in advance. By the 1970s, you could dial directly, and now you can dial directly to people without actually knowing where they are. It's also not your parents' business world. When I grew up, factories were in one place and the people worked within that physical building. Maybe they got supplies from another building. They managed everything by calls on wire lines. Now you outsource. You do just in time. You not only outsource, you have factories all over the world and you put critical infrastructure on the network. Finally, it's neither your parents' communications world nor their business world. You have people traveling to places where they get eavesdropped upon. The, the U.S. government's advice when, you travel in, when a business person travels in China is to get a blank phone and a blank laptop when they, leave, when they go to get to China and to throw it out on their return because there's viruses and malware that is going to then transmit information back. The other aspect of this is it used to be that switches in the U.S. were built by AT&T, actually by uh, General Electric, who... Um, 
who worked for it was, was a subsidiary. But, um, but phone switches in other parts of the world were built in other ways. Now we've gone to much more of a global outs in, uh, sourcing of, of material, which means if somebody finds a problem in a Cisco switch in uh, Estonia, it's likely to be the same problem in that Cisco switch in Kansas. And furthermore, if they can break into the switch in Estonia, they can break into the switch in Kansas without traveling. Building wiretapping capability into infrastructure and applications creates risks. The way it creates risks is you used to have a model where law enforcement went to the carriers and said, here's the wiretap order. And the carriers looked at the wiretap order. Now, one of the problems when you make everything automatic, and that's what Kalia does, is that you remove the phone companies from that role. Worse than removing the phone companies from that role is you remove the self-patrolling behavior of law enforcement. You all know that if somebody is going to look at something you do, then you do it much better than if nobody's going to look at it. It's just human nature. And you remove technical forms of minimization. So one of the things that got uncovered after the warrantless wiretapping was going on a while is one of the people who was picked up on the warrantless wiretapping was the former president of the United States, Bill Clinton. What kind of system picks up Bill Clinton's wiretapping unless it's, it's not been correctly configured? There's the risk of exploitation and there's the risk of overcollection. So let me give you some examples. Uh, you guys know the Greek wiretapping case? Yes? No. Good. Some yes, some no. Um, Greek wiretapping case. Between June 2004, March 2000, uh, sometime 2000, early, first half of the year 2004 to January 2005, so it's 10 months, work backwards from January um, 2005, 100 senior members of the Greek government were wiretapped. They were using cell phones from Greek, on, on the Greek Vodafone network. Greek Vodafone had bought the cell, uh, the, a switch from Ericsson. Greek Vodafone was not interested in wiretapping. So they hadn't paid for wiretapping capability. But when Ericsson did an update, wiretapping capability was put into the switch. Um, now, Greek Vodafone, but it wasn't turned on. Okay, it wasn't turned on. Greek Vodafone hadn't paid for wiretapping capability, so there was no audit capability on the switch. Somebody else went into the switch, turned on the wiretapping capability. For 10 months, they wiretapped. Every time the switch got updated, the wiretapping capability got updated was found out when SMS went awry. Some, some SMS went awry, Greek Vodafone went in to investigate, the wiretapping was uncovered. The, the communications were being sent to 16 cell phones. I've now told you how it was done. If you want to read in detail, there's a very nice description in IEEE Spectrum called the Athens Affair. I haven't told you who did it, because only the people who did it know it. Telecom Italia, between 1996 and 2006, 6,000 people in Italy uh, were wiretapped illegally. Judges, celebrities, uh, sports figures, referees, um, politicians. That means that one in 10,000 Italians was wiretapped, more than one in 10,000. One in 10,000 Italians was explicitly wiretapped. Anybody they talked to was, of course, also tapped during the course of the call. That means that there was no business deal or major business deal or major political deal that was private in Italy during that period. This was presumably an insider's job for blackmail and bribery. Cisco. Cisco did the right thing. It built an architecture for law enforcement wiretapping, published the architecture. That's the right way to do it. You don't do security through obscurity. This architecture sat around for four years. Tom Cross, a researcher at IBM, looked at it and realized that it made recommendations but not requirements on the crypto if you didn't implement according to the recommendations, you could spoof the switch and, and wiretap without auditing. Okay? It had been implemented without the recommendations in various uh, telcos. Making it easy to wiretap means more wiretapping. So now I'm going to talk about the FBI. Post September 11th, the FBI set up its communications assistant unit with Provide, with technical people from AT&T, Verizon, and I don't remember who the third one was. I don't remember if it was T-Mobile or not. Um, the idea, I think it probably was. The idea was to simplify getting of information. Um, and what the Patriot Act allowed was something called exigent, let, well, uh, Patriot Act 
allowed national security letters, which said you could get all sorts of business records, phone records, and so on, if the information was part of an ongoing terrorist investigation. You had to fill out a form, a legal form, national security letter. The people working with the FBI came up with the idea of exigent letters. Let's dash off a letter that says, we'll get you the national security letter sometime, but right now we need this information right away. It's an exigent circumstance. Well, guess what happened? The exigent letters were never followed up with NSLs, national security letters. Data was sometimes given without written requests. Lack of specificity in the written request. So let me give you a particular example that I find extremely upsetting. One of the people, actually seven of the people that they were interested in, so, so this process, by the way, of the exigent letters then got exported to other FBI offices. One of the, seven of the people they were interested in were journalists. Journalists um, have a lot of protection under the law. They, of course, have the First Amendment, but the Code of Federal Regulation says no wiretapping or collection of transactional information of journalists without a written request by the, a written order of the Attorney General. Okay, so you can't wiretap without a court order, but you actually need also the Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney General to sign on. Why? Because the First Amendment is pretty important in the United States. And if journalists can't protect their sources, then they can't do journalism. The exigent letters didn't have specificity. So they were tracking, in one case, a journalist in, uh, who was working in Indonesia, an American journalist, and they thought that she was talking to a possible terrorist. They didn't suspect her of any malfeasance, but they wanted to track the possible terrorist. So they put in this exigent letter with no requirement on the dates. They tapped her for seven months. She was not in Indonesia for anything close to that. They did it for seven, seven different journalists. And then they employed something called the community of interest tools without written requests. Community of interest says, let me look at everybody this person is talking to. Oh, and everybody they're talking to, and everybody they're talking to. Okay. Sometimes they ran hot numbers. They said, I'm interested in this number. Tell me what's going on. No written request. When you don't have a written request, you can't check whether they were doing things they shouldn't have, because there's no trail. So, I need to talk to you about the types of threats we face. Non-state actors. That guy over there is Kim Philby. He worked um, for the British government, spying for the, the Soviet Union. And underneath, of course, we have uh, nation states. And we have many kinds of nation states. We have the nation states who are not necessarily our friends, and the nation states we think of as our friends, but who don't always treat us that way. The threats from non-state actors get a lot of noise in the press, and I think it's something that you probably care about a lot because it affects you. I want to say on a national security level, so far they're not serious. This is the level of threat we get. If it's somebody that hits your site, you're in trouble. But on a national security level, it, it's, not, it's not really the important set of issues. The insiders are historically the most dangerous type of threat because they know your systems, they know your vulnerabilities, and they know your audit methods, and they know how to get around them. Okay? Bradley Manning, for those of you who didn't recognize him. Um, and the attacks from state actors. So I have an attack there. The only significance of this attack, there are two pieces of significance. One is it was unpatched systems at military sites, same kind of lack of patching at all four sites. The only real significance of this story is that the U.S. government released the information. It was, it's the Tish and Rain case. And what the guys did is they went in, bundled the stuff they were interested, took it out, put it on ser you know, various launching servers. I got told the other day that it was a sysadmin at Ohio, uh, one of the Ohio universities, maybe right, uni I don't remember which university, who noticed there was all of a sudden a large amount of traffic in the middle of the night going from Wright Air Force Base to Leeds University and said something funny is going on. In GhostNet, you, see tro you saw Trojans hidden within emails, and they were targeted Trojans, um, by, and you were seeing more and more sophisticated attacks using highly targeted email, which themselves contain malware. The interest was in long-term access. The cyber exploitation, which is called Advanced Persistent Threat, because everybody wants an acronym, and APT is the new acronym. This is a very short list. There isn't a major US company, European company, probably Australian company, that hasn't been hit multiple times. Major U.S. government site and so on. 
So who's spying during the Cold War? It was the Soviet Union. In the 1970s, their interests turned to defense contractors because those were less protected than military sites. Plus, you could get trade groups in. So Patrick Moynihan tells this one, former senator, well, no longer alive, Patrick uh, Moynihan tells this wonderful story that trade groups who were visiting airline manufacturers, air, airplane manufacturers in the United States who were building things like the stealth bombers and so on, the trade delegations from the Soviet Union were wearing double stick tape on the bottom of their shoes to pick up the metal composite so that they could then analyze it, figure out what we were building. By the 1980s, it wasn't just the Soviet Union. I said France is not a friend of ours. French government has explicitly said, in military affairs, we're allies. In trade affairs, we're not. We'll spy on you. It's official government policy uh, to do that sort of thing by France, Israel, Japan, um, as well as, of course, countries that are very much not our friends, like Iran. In 2003, the FBI estimated the cost to US industry at 200 billion, but nobody really knows the numbers. The two new issues are the internet and China. The internet makes it a whole lot easier to do industrial espionage. It's a whole lot cheaper. It takes years to develop trade delegations and the friendship or you know, the comradeship or whatever it is that gets their people into our factories. It doesn't take years to develop the ability to access our systems. And the other, of course, is, uh, issue is China, uh, which began, be, was very interested in the, uh, our behavior during the Iraq war and changed what it was going to focus on. Let me change tactic, a topic one more time. This is uh, the after effects of Hurricane Katrina. Um, for those of you who don't know, you all know Creative Commons. That's a Creative Commons photo. What risks do we face? The Haitian earthquake had 230,000 dead. Katrina, 1,800 dead. The tsunami, 283,000. If you go back in history, you see huge numbers, absolutely huge numbers. The US doesn't tend to think about those kinds of numbers because except for the western part of the country, the western part of the country has not had a serious earthquake in a long time, except for the western part of the country. All the other kinds of problems we have are either in places where there isn't much population, like the Midwest where tornadoes haven't hit major population areas because there aren't major population areas typically in Tornado Alley, or in places where you actually have time to prepare the hurricanes. Uh, but these are the kinds of numbers you see. Well, what do you need when there's a, a disaster? Your wire lines may be down. That certainly happened to us in western Massachusetts um, in late October. Um, your cell phone towers may be down or power may be down. Satellite phones only work when there are no tall buildings, mountains, or clouds. And they're very expensive. So what happened in Louisiana is that the townships, the, the, um, they're not called townships, they're called uh, parishes, had not kept up their, the federal government had paid for a satellite, use, uh, satellite phones for the parishes, but once the parishes had to take over paying for it, they stopped. What works instead is land mobile radio. Because you guys are sysadmins, you've probably thought about why cars, police cars have so many antenna. It's the district, you have to communicate with your district and the district next door and fire and fire next door and EMT and EMT next door and they're all on different uh, systems. So what land mobile radio needs is interoperability, interoperability, interoperability. But it also needs security. I talked to um, some, the technical director at the um, uh, information Assurance Directed at, at NSA. So NSA has two halves. The halves everybody talks about, which is signals intelligence, and the half which nobody talks about, it only takes 15% of the budget, information assurance. 15% of the budget, but 50% of the mission. I talked to the, head, the technical director of Information Assurance um, a couple of years ago. He said, we want to see secure land mobile radio available for sale in Radio Shack. And then he said, oops, I'm not supposed to say that. The not supposed to say it part was the Radio Shack part. He's not supposed to mention a specific company. They want to see secure land mobile radio available for sale in the malls. Why? Because if it's cheap, then first responders get it. If it's cheap, of course, the drug dealers and everybody else get it. But from the Information Assurance Directorate point of view, that's the way we need to go. So I'm going to go all the way back to the 1780s 
and talk about the preamble to the Constitution, which says, we are to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. What happens when you build wiretapping capability into a switch or an application? It lasts for a very long time. In 1994, when Kalia was passed, the threats we saw were drug dealers, organized crime, and the like. We didn't see China coming. We didn't see the kinds of hacking into US systems and the cyber exploitation. I know that here, you do spend a lot of time thinking about botnet and DDoS attack and spam and so on and so forth, because that's a large part of your job. But if you back off and you think about what are the real national security threats, the national security threats are cyber exploitation. And that was not seen in 1994. Not seen by Congress, not seen by the President, not seen essentially by NSA. The preamble to the Constitution says we need to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. What that says is you secure a communications network. And if you look at the actions of the National Security Agency in the last 10 years, it's very interesting. So through the 1990s, we had the crypto wars. And the NSA and the FBI were on one side, and industry and academia were on the other. 2000, the US government switches and says you can export strong crypto and product. In most cases, there's certain exceptions if you're selling to government, if you're selling communications infrastructure, but otherwise you can export strong crypto and product, which means, among other things, that strong crypto is going to be available for domestic product. It had never been regulated, but it was de facto regulated by the export control. What you have in 2000 is FBI is very upset by that. 2001 happens. One senator urges change in crypto regs. White House, NSA don't respond. Nothing happens. Crypto regs stay. 2001, after September 11th, AES 128, 192, and 256 strong encryption algorithm is approved by NIST for use of protecting you know, all the uses that you use a symmetric key algorithm. 2002, the NSA approves the use of an AES for classified communications as long as it's in an approved implementation. What that means is it will further increase the market for AES. 2005, the NSA approves a set of algorithms, uh, Suite B, for securing a communications network. Quietly, NSA is pushing to secure communications within the United States. It would be very happy not to secure communications outside the United States, but within the United States, it's working to, to secure communications. It's not doing it with great fanfare, but it is doing. Secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. What do we need? We need to enable secure communications in times of national and international disaster, natural or otherwise. We need to secure civilian communications. We need to enable successful investigations of criminal and terrorism cases. What do we need for surveillance? I've told you how valuable transactional information is. When the NSA agreed on the change in crypto regs, it's partially because it went to network exploitation, partially because it knew the value of transactional information. Vulnerability of the end hosts, and I'm sure that I'm going to get a lot of questions on that. But the point is, you can either build wiretapping capability into the applications or the switches, or you can take advantage when the end host is vulnerable. Don't cause the end host to be vulnerable, but if you have an all court authorization for a wiretap and you really need to authorize, and you really need to do that wiretap, you take advantage of the vulnerability. And you do, like the NSA does, use clever solutions. Point is, Kalia isn't free, but putting back doors, front doors, or whatever you want to call them, doors into communications infrastructure costs all of us. It's just not law enforcement who's paying the bill. Getting communications security right means understanding that security of communications is necessary for freedom, security, human dignity, and consent of the governed. You should do communications security. I'm sorry, it's light gray on my screen, the first one. I don't know if you can see it. I can't see it from here. Um, I never realized that before. Um, communication security should be designed thinking about the blessings of freedom for posterity. So when you build a vulnerability in, how long is that vulnerability going to last and who is going to take advantage of it? 
It should not impede the working of the press. Why? Look at the Arab Spring. The press is, are the canaries in the coal mine. You impede the working of the press, that's just a first step to impeding the freedom of the public. And any suspension of communications privacy must be brief. Why brief? If you suspend communications privacy, if we have a terrible thing happen, if a nuclear weapon goes, over, goes off in one of our cities, there will be all sorts of freedom suspended. If you suspend it with the idea that you're suspending it for years, then you suspend it building infrastructure in. If you suspend it with the idea that you're, measure, you're doing it briefly, you don't build the infrastructure in. So take the long view. All of you sitting here are using a keyboard that looks more or less like that. That was designed so that the keys most frequently used don't hit each other as you type. That was designed to make typing difficult, okay? And how long are we using this? Long after all those keyboards and metal keys went away? A very long time. And with that, uh, I don't have copies of my book, but you can read more about this in my book, which came out this year. Thank you. Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, I'm just thinking that it's, uh, it seems very futile to wiretap when encrypting, uh, say, instant messages end-to-end -end is so trivial these days. So what you're left with in, in, the, in the best case, I guess, is a social graph of who is com communicating with who. And uh, you know, we, have, we have this law in, in Europe right now that says that uh, ISPs need to store information for two years and so on and so forth. And I'm well, it's, it's not clear how that's getting implemented. It's very, yeah. the implementation is. Yeah, so uh, my, you know, I understand that stupid criminals also need to, they're also criminals and they should be locked up, but it seems so easy to just encrypt the communication end to end. And uh, what is the solution to that? Are you, are we gonna have laws that say effectively that uh, you can't communicate in a way that the government or some authority can't wiretap? So there's the question of who we mean by we. Um, and in the US, the FBI floated the idea last September in an article in the New York Times, that is they were interviewed, they didn't say it directly, floated the idea of banning encryption or making encryption only possible if the service provider had the keys and so on and so forth. In conversations with members of the, relatively high members of the US government, it's clear that that's not going anywhere. In fact, I think actually in testimony in February, the FBI said they were no longer interested in the encryption solution. Uh, so that's an answer to one part of your question. Um, the British have a different answer, and they actually, I believe, under RIPA, Regulatory Blah 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 Protection Act, um, do require the release of the keys. Um, I don't know what happens other than jail if you encrypt and, you know, that is encrypt by yourself. But of course, we all know that homegrown solutions are much easier to break. Um, that's one piece of the answer. Another piece of the answer is, in fact, the social graph is extremely useful. Um, let me give you the example, my favorite example, which is if you were looking at the pattern of communications the weekend before Oracle announced it was buying Sun, and you saw that um, the Oracle and Sun CEOs spoke, and then they both spoke to their chief counsels, and then they both spoke again, and then they spoke to their chief counsels, and, and you just watched that pattern. You knew everything that was going to happen on Monday morning without having listened to a single conversation. So uh, transactional information is something that at least NSA is using to tremendous effect. Um, where it is less useful is not in the investigatory phase, but in the uh, prosecution phase. Um, and so the answer is, look, we've got a lot more data than we used to. Uh, everybody is littering everything with, um, you know, how many people do not have cell phones? and do not say where they are and who they're associating with all the time. Um, that's part of the answer. 
Um, part of the answer is that people, many people are using centralized communications, which are going to be easy to tap no matter what happens. And part of the answer is that in some cases, law enforcement is going to have to spend more money because the alternative of making it too easy to, to break into systems, to break into people's communications puts us all at risk. Yeah, but I, uh, it seems almost like uh, we are uh, counting on people to not encrypt their traffic because if everybody was just using end-to-end -end encryption, then the NSA would have a resource problem or the FBI would have a resource problem. Precisely. Um, will not the bad guys know all this and always encrypt? Um, so there are many flavors of bad guys, okay? And the stupid bad guys, of which there are many, don't encrypt. Um, the fact in 1994 there were slides from the F 1992 there were slides from the FBI that said by 94 or 96 either 40 or 60 percent of communications were going to be encrypted. We're not even close to that yet. The every year since 2000, um, the wiretap report has to release how many communications that were wiretapped law enforcement ran into trouble with because they were encrypted. The last time I looked at the data, which was last spring, one in the 10 years, exactly one, which is to say, not to say only one was encrypted. I think something like 20 total were encrypted, but, but all of those, 19 of those were trivial to break and only one, one required any bit of effort. To get back to you, um, you're asking a whole bunch of different questions. So if you ask them in order, I can answer them, but they're contradictory questions, so they have contradictory answers. Uh, but I don't know if other people also want to jump in. But, but go ahead, we'll start with them and then... Okay, I'll let somebody else jump in. Thank you. But if no, okay. <laughs> so I'm from Sweden, so this is not a question, it's just a, a comment on your talk. It's not a pretty picture you're painting here, but in Sweden a couple of years ago we, we passed a law whereby the government is allowed to... Uh, listen in on all IP traffic that crosses the border, precisely like you said here, and they do that, and uh, it's uh, completely untransparent, and uh, no one knows what they're doing with the result. Right, and it was believed that perhaps the, the traffic would stop transiting Sweden, but I, uh, Gen, it seems to me Jen Rexford and a group of people actually looked as whether or not the traffic changed, and it didn't. Yes, it did. Uh, so the majority of the traffic from Russia to uh, U.S. actually passed Sweden, but it doesn't any longer. That seems different from what I thought Jen had found, actually. Okay, this is just what I've read. Okay. Um, the recent arrest in... Um, New York, uh, the Attorney General explicitly used the, uh, the phrase lone wolf. L explicitly used the phrase? Lone wolf. Um, right. Um, remind me of the... Um... Um, this was the, the person that you just talked about uh, who went to Colorado? Najib Ullah He was... I think so. Yeah. Um, he was wiretapped because he had gone to Pakistan a number of times. Right. And that was, um, and it was a Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act tap, and uh, so all the Title III stuff is public, all the uh, FISA stuff, the only thing that's public is the, um, is the uh, number of taps per year. Um, but I suspect his tap came under the category so so he was tapped because the communica he was not being tapped within the United States he was being tapped because he was communi the communication was within the United States to outside the United States so that's not a FISA tap at all actually yeah. um, on, on a so my statement about lone yeah. wolf yeah. was about something where you actually need a wiretap order yeah. uh, the the other thing was the government of India um, uh, was trying to ban Blackberries, because they could not tap the communications of the of the Blackberries within India, because they were worried about security and well, in particular the Mumbai yeah. attack. Yeah. There were communications going on 
as the attack was occurring and they weren't able to. So uh, last summer, a year and a half ago, um, uh, India, UAE, and Dubai all tried to get BlackBerry to change. And what they wanted was um, a point of presence within their country where they could get access to the communications. RIM did not accede. My understanding is now that RIM is doing some changes. The US government, the FBI pushed for, in their <coughs> initial statement a year and, and a, a quarter ago, in, in that September 2011, 2010 article in the Times, they, I, I believe they also talked about point of presence, but what they were talking about was a legal point of presence. So they didn't actually want access, but they wanted access to the lawyers. They wanted access to the company so that it didn't take longer in the case of a case. So I'm going to focus on a slightly different thing. Uh, I want to talk about the cost of Kalia mm -hmm. that uh, is not being borne by law enforcement. Uh, as we run out of IPv4 addresses, which is happening relatively soon now, um, more and more things are going to be driven towards carrier-grade NAT. Kalia requires an ISP to be able to identify from a session log who was responsible for the session, or at least which household served is responsible for the session. Prior to carrier grade NAT, that's relatively trivial because this IP address in this DHCP log went to that house. With the advent of carrier grade NAT, you're going to have to maintain logs that represent pretty much every single TCP transaction, UDP transaction, et cetera. Everything that does a state transition in the state tables on your carrier grade NAT. Some estimates put that at roughly a terabyte per day for every 8,000 subscribers. When you consider that Comcast and some of the other large ISPs in the United States have 23 million or so subscribers, you divide that by 8,000, multiply by a terabyte per day, you come up with a disk farm that EMC isn't sure how to build. So and then you have to maintain that for seven years. Right. What has been FCC's reaction to it, since they're the ones that do the regulation? They haven't reacted so far, and... So far, the ISPs that I've talked to that have considered the question and don't see a way to get around having to deploy some level of carrier grade NAT that's going to cause a problem with this has been, I guess we're going to have to factor the fines into the cost of doing business. <laughs> now, I heard some of this issue not from a Kalia standpoint, but from uh, an idea of doing packet level attribution and uh, carrier grade NAT, which is very disturbing. And that's a different talk in a different paper. Um, I hadn't heard it in this context, but what it really says is that Kalia doesn't make sense in this context. Um, if you were willing to write some of that up and send it to me, I have people that I've been talking to at FCC that might be able to hear it. Thank you. Uh, Nikolai Plum from Booking.com. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned Kalia and how people will do more automated wiretaps if they can just do it themselves. Um, uh, I've read a few articles briefly talking about um, that essentially Kalia implementations aren't very scalable and um, people can overuse them and they cause, cause reliability problems. Do you, do you have any comments on... I'm sorry, uh, they're not very scalable in what? They're not very scalable in the sense that you can only tap N lines and if everybody goes very enthusiastic, they can run out of tap capacity. But also, does this affect um, service reliability? I mean, Vodafone Greece had a reliability problem. Is that widespread right, so, or um, just a one-off? The Kalia taps, the, um, when the FBI put forth its, um, its standards, so what happened is when Kalia passed, the law was written in such a way that the telcos understood that they were going to negotiate with Department of Justice, which they knew meant FBI in this particular case, over the standards. And what they felt actually happened was that the standards were being imposed upon them. There were actually a number of court cases, and the, the implementation was delayed quite a long time, and not all of it has been done yet. In part of the standards, um, at the time that Kalia was passed, um, there were, um, I want to say, 1,500 wiretaps annually. And then not very many pen register trap and trace orders. The numbers on pen and, tra pen and trap and trace have shot up enormously. I'm not going to remember them. Um, I want to say 2,300 a day at AT&T. Multiply that by the other three large carriers um, and 365, and you get a very, very different scale. 
Um, I don't know how that fits with the numbers the FBI was requesting at the time. The numbers the FBI was requesting at the time, I want to say, are 60, 40,000, 30,000 simultaneous taps in New York, which was crazy given that you had 1,500 taps going on simultaneously, uh, 1,500 taps. So um, what you have is in many ways a law that was passed with a different threat model and a different type of technology and being try, trying to be applied to a new technology and a new mode of communication. So let me answer it in yet a different way. Um, cell phone calls and telephone calls have the same average length, which is about two minutes. But there's much greater variance in, uh, that's the same um, average, uh, average length, mean length, sorry, uh, not mean, uh, median length, the same median length. The average for a phone call, for a wireline call, is much longer than for a cell phone call. Um, and we all know this. I mean, we all know the behavior on cell phones is very different from the behavior on wirelines. Uh, the result is that we're, commu uh, you know, that's one example of a very large set of examples we could create about how much more we're communicating now than previously. But the law was passed in a model of you make a phone call, you're on it for a while. Uh, so there are a lot of ways in which the law has not is not appropriate for the modern mode of communication. So I'm, I'm sort of begging the question by agreeing with you. If you're all done, then we can go home early or whatever the line is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>